All right, for those of you that are guests with us, we do not always start our uh, time of preaching off with what's love got to do with it, but today we did. Now, I will be honest and say we did um, uh, start a sermon series once with, let's talk about sex, baby. So you just never know what you're going to get. Hey, um, there's a young lady, um, she was uh, named Anna Mae um, Bullock. She grew up in Tennessee, and um, she had a crazy wild life. She ended up um, writing songs. She ended up um, taking off in the music industry, created quite a career for herself. In fact, you and I know her as probably the grandmother of rock and roll. She hit it big in the 80s, and she is the one that's saying, what's love got to do with it? And we honestly all know her as who? Tina Turner. Tina Turner. Now, she wrote the song, What's Love Got to Do With It? And unfortunately, I don't think she's ever figured it out yet. Um, For her, what's love got to do with it meant that she's moved from relationship to relationship to relationship looking for fulfillment. And so this morning, what I'm going to propose to you as um, we are in week three of I Love My Church, what does love have to do with it? Everything. So say everything. I'm going to ask you the question, what's love got to do with it? got everything to do with it. If you have your Bibles this morning, um, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's a familiar passage, one that many of us have heard, Um, and so we're just going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, and we're going to read the whole chapter, all 13 verses, all right? So join me as we read. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, But I have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Say nothing this morning. Nothing. This is going to be a word that's going to continue to resonate, and so Will you help me define nothing? What is the definition of nothing? Not a zero zilch. Not a zero zilch. That's the Greek, all right, for nothing. It means nothing, all right? Continue on. Verse 3, if I give all that I possess to the poor, and I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. There's that word again. Not a zero zilch. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. Now let me stop right here because many of you are going, now that's starting to sound familiar. You've attended a wedding, you've attended um, some sort of ceremony, and the preacher always begins to read this. Love is patient, love is kind. And I just want to stop for a second and tell you that context is everything. Um, When Paul was writing, he was writing to the church at Corinth, He was not standing before a bride and a groom. In fact, he's writing a letter, listen to me, to the bride of Christ, the church, that's you and I, on behalf of the bridegroom, okay? And so this really has a greater implication rather than just your marriage. It is important to put these things on display in your marriage, but they're not written just for the way husbands and wives ought to respond to one another. This is really written so so we as the church, so we as the body of Christ know how to respond to one another. So let's continue in verse number four. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails. Some translations say love never ends. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, But when perfection comes, what's he talking about? 
when perfection comes, when Christ returns, when Christ returns, the imperfect disappears. He goes on to say, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put those behind me. Verse 12, now we see but a poor reflection, a poor reflection as in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. When Christ returns, we will see him face to face. Let me give you a little clarity as what he is talking about. You see, when I was a youth pastor um, in Central Texas, we did this event every Monday night through the summer, and we called it Monday Night Madness. And so we would gather my students, and we would do crazy things on Monday nights. Like we would have a, a, a night that was themed around toilets and plungers. Everything that we did, we involved plungers and toilets. We had a great time. I loved student ministry. But this one particular night, we just watched a movie. And the movie got done early, and so um, the students weren't ready to go home yet. And so the guys kind of got together in a little huddle, and they began to, to form a plan. They wanted to load the ladies up and take them to a place called Jake's Hill. Now, Jake's Hill is way out in the boonies. You all have heard of the boonies, right? Yeah, you go as far out of town as you can and hang a left, then you arrive in the boonies, all right? And so in central Texas, out in the boonies, there is this bridge, all right? And the legend goes something like this, that years ago, Jake went to the bridge, not our Jake, okay, don't be confused, but Jake goes to the bridge and he hung himself. And so the legend says that if you take your car and you park on the bridge and you put your car in neutral, the ghost of Jake will push you off the bridge. Now, we all know it's just physics, right? It's really not any ghost. But the reality was the students, the guys wanted to take the girls, and they just wanted to scare the mess out of them. Well, I was very protective. I loved our young ladies, and I could not stand to let them um, be scared. So here's what I did. I told our ladies, go with them but stall 15 minutes. Give us some time. And what I mean by give us some time was give myself, my intern, and my college helper some time to get to the boonies before them. And so we are in the truck, and we're taking off to Jake's Hill. And on the way, one of the local guys began to tell me a little more about this legend. He said, the legend even says that if Jake pushes you across the bridge, He'll leave white handprints on the back of your car. And I said, guys, wouldn't it be awesome if we had some kind of powder? And my intern that's driving, he played football for Mary Harden Baylor, and he said, you know what? Today was a gym day. I've got my gym bag. And, and, and in every football player's gym bag on weightlifting day, they've got talcum powder. So this was awesome, right? I'm in the back seat, and I'm like just dousing powder everywhere. And I am ready. And so they park the truck, and we get out, and we hide in the weeds, right? And we are waiting. And finally, off in the distance, we see headlights coming. And there's two sets of headlights. There's two cars. The first car stops on the bridge. The second car behind it. Guys get out of the second car, shake the mess out of the front car. Girls scream. And so we're like, yes, this is them. And so as they are proceeding off the bridge, we're just kind of walking with our little ghostly swag on the dirt road there. And, and about that time, I look to my right, I look to my left, and my partners have abandoned me. Well, in the, the moment, I mean, this is a matter of moments, I think I'm going to play this up really well. And so as the car approaches me, I do what any good youth pastor would do. I jumped onto the hood of the car. I put my hands right up there where those windshield wipers are, and I held on for dear life. And when I looked in at the driver, I didn't recognize her. I have no idea who this young lady is. So I thought, well, maybe they picked up a friend. And so with absolute confidence, I shifted my attention from the driver to the passenger. 
I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue who this young lady is. All I know is they are highly concerned and alarmed at this point. I look into the back seat. There are three young ladies in the back seat. All of them are screaming bloody murder. I know absolutely none of them. And I'm certain in that moment they wet their pants. Promise you. And so from that moment, I'm sure that the legend of Jake's Hill is alive and well today in Central Texas. But here in that moment, a matter of seconds, I thought to myself, they came to see Jake. Maybe they think I'm Jake, the ghost. So like any good youth pastor would do, I'm hanging on for dear life, and I simply yelled, Get off my bridge! And I rolled off the car. Now, They stopped up the road a little ways, and the guys stopped behind them, and the girls are like, oh, we've seen him, we've seen him. And they're trying to convince the guys they've really seen a ghost, right? And and so, you know, they they assure them, and they drive off. Well, here's the problem. They were scared. When they came face to face with me, they they were alarmed. They they were absolutely fearful. They probably wet their pants because they came face to face with a stranger in the night. Now, had it been my students, had it been my girls, if they saw me on the hood of their car, the response would have been different because they would have known me. There would have been uh, nervous laughter. It would have been funny, ha-ha, no urination in the seat. You know what I'm saying? The thing that makes all the difference when you come face to face is do we know that person? Well, Paul is writing at 1 Corinthians 13. He says, At some point, you will come face to face. You see, we have a God that that is going to send his son Jesus back for his bride. And when Jesus breaks through the eastern sky, he's going to come to you face to face. And in that moment, the thing that's going to make all the difference in the world is, do you know him? Do you know him? And so at this point, we are imperfect And there is gifts of prophecy and tongues and and things of the Spirit. But in that moment, when perfection comes, all those things cease. It says this. If you continue on, we're face to face. And he says, now I know in part, but I shall know fully. At that moment, we know fully, even as I am fully known. And then listen to this. And now these things... These three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Now, here's here's what he's saying. Faith, hope, and love. You see, here in the here and now, we're walking in faith and hope. Faith and hope. We put our faith in Jesus. We put our hope in the reality that he will one day come and take his bride. And so on that day when he comes and we are face to face with him, we no longer need faith. We no longer need hope. Our faith and our hope, the substance of our faith and our hope is fulfilled in the return of Jesus. Make sense? When he comes, you're no longer hoping, hey, I hope he really keeps his word and comes back. But the only thing at that moment that will continue, that will remain is what? Love. I'm going to propose to you today that if you want to do something that makes an eternal difference, something that will last for all eternity, you do it in love. And so I'm going to give you this morning five things that I think make love a priority. Five priorities of love. And if you're following along on version, they are all there for you. And so I'm going to move rather quickly If you're taking notes, you want to jot these down. But number one, the priority of love. Without love, without love, everything that you say is ineffective. Without love, everything you say is ineffective. And here's what I mean by that. There are some of you that you've been trying to convince a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a co-worker. You've been trying to convince them that they need to acknowledge their sin and give their life to Jesus. But you have had conversations that have been belittling. You've had conversations that have been full of criticism. You've had conversations that have been less than loving. And you wonder why it's not producing results. 
you nagging all the time how others ought to get their life right and live more like you does not produce anything. Without love, listen to me, without love, all that you say, all that you say is ineffective. Now, on the flip side of that, if you communicate and you, you share your heart and you share your concerns and you do it with love, you do it with love, it becomes effective. You see, Scripture said in 1 Corinthians 13, if I sing or I speak with the tongues of angels, but I have not love, you know what you sound like? You sound like a gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, if you're going to those people that you, you, you profess to love, and you're having those conversations, but you're doing it devoid of love, you know what they're hearing? Anybody ever watch the Charlie Brown specials, right? And you remember, how's the teacher sound? Wah, 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 wah. That's all they're hearing. If you're not having a conversation filled with grace and love, it's ineffective. It doesn't matter what you say to them. It will not produce internal life change and transformation. Now, it may, listen, it may create some external behavior modification just because they want to please you, but, but, but without love, it's not an internal transformation that pushes them sincerely toward Jesus. So number two, the priority of love. Without love, without love, all that I know is incomplete. Without love, all that I know is incomplete. You know what one of the greatest enemies toward our witness to others is? It's our ego, pride, and arrogance. Our ego, pride, and arrogance, that, that reality that we think we know it all and that we can't be told or talked. When you proceed apart from love and you have conversations that are not filled with love and you already know it all, without love, it's pride, it's arrogant, it's egotistical, and no one listens. And, and really the truth is what you think you know, you really don't know a whole lot. Without love, what we think we know is incomplete. Remember, our text says, you may, you may understand all the mysteries, you may fathom all the mysteries, but without love, you've gained nothing. You've gained nothing. And so making love a priority without it, all that we say is ineffective. Everything we know is incomplete. Number three, without love, all that I believe is insufficient without love all that I believe is insufficient you see for some of you you say you believe God can make a difference in your child you believe God can make a difference in your neighbor you believe God can make a difference in your co-worker but you don't live and you haven't made priority a love the priority of love in your life and so what happens is all that we believe is really insufficient Without love, what we believe is insufficient. So with love, with love, and I look at my coworker, my family, my child, and I believe. And I believe God is who he says he is, and I believe he can make a difference in their life. You see, then it becomes sufficient. With love, we, we have a true, earnest, steadfast hope and belief. Number four, the priority of love. Without love. This is, this is important. Without love, everything that I give, everything that I give is insignificant. Without love, everything I give is insignificant. You see, many of you will say, I've, I've given everything I have. Scripture says, I've given all my possessions. But if you do it without love, you've accomplished nothing. You see, but I would say on the flip side of that, with, with giving of ourselves, with giving of our resources, when we do that with a heart filled with love, the same love that God has when he sent his son Jesus, it becomes significant. In fact, let me just tell you this. Next weekend, 
We're going to wrap up I Love My Church. We're going to hear your stories. We're going to have an awesome time of testimonies next weekend. We're going to cap off I Love My Church by taking an I Love My Church offering. And here, let me just be honest with you. If you come next weekend and you give, I don't care how small or how big your gift is, if you come and you do that without love, I'm going to ask you just to keep it. Because it will become insignificant. However, if we come and we understand that God loves his bride and he's called us to love one another and we collectively and sacrificially give from a heart overflowing with love, I don't care what that number turns out to be, it will make a significant impact for the kingdom because it's been released in love. You see, for us on your tables, there's baby bottles and we're just throwing our change in there for the Pregnancy Resource Center. And that might seem insignificant, but if we do that in love, I promise you it becomes significant. For the young mother who is, who is debating whether to, to, to end a pregnancy or to keep or to uh, consider adoption, that change given in love will make all the difference in the world. May 17th and 18th, we're partnering with Feed My Starving Children and 22 cents for one meal a day for a child. That may seem so insignificant to us. It's one-fourth of a road soda. But, but 22 cents given in love. I promise, if you ask one of those children that received those meals, it is significant. So, if without love, everything we give is insignificant. Number five, everything that I accomplish... Without love, everything that I accomplish is actually inadequate. What I accomplish is inadequate. Even if I were to say, mountain be moved, big deal. If I do that without love, big deal. You, you may accomplish a lot of things in your life. You may, you may run up the career ladder and you become the, the most important person in your place of employment. But apart from love, big deal. It's nothing. Here's the truth, and I want you to, to listen to this. I want you to grasp this. Remember, Jesus is going to return for his bride. He is going to return. We talked about this in uh, Scandalous Love. He's a refining God, and he's going to come with eyes of fire. And in that moment, in that moment, everything in our life that does not match up to the standard of his word will be burned away. Remember, the, the only thing that remains in that moment, love remains. And so anything you've done apart from love, boom, gone. At that moment, it doesn't matter that you were a wealthy CEO. In that moment, it doesn't matter that you were voted most popular in your class. In that moment, it doesn't matter that you coached the winning little league team. In that moment, none of that stuff matters. Now, what will matter is if you were the CEO that loved your employees and you pointed them to Jesus, that last. If you're the little league coach that you were patient with those sweet little children and you gave them the love that they did not receive anywhere else, and you push them to Jesus, that will last. You see, whatever is devoid of love is gone. And so why is it important for us? Why is it important for us to get this? Because it's the only thing that really matters. So number two this morning, not only should love be our priority, but it should be something we practice. I'm going to give you four things. I'm going to move real quick. But these are four things that if you're living a life of love, these will be on display in your life. Here's what you need to understand this morning. We are the bride of Christ, and when we say, I love my church, yes, I hope you love Terranova Church. But greater than that, I want you to love the body of Christ. Who is the church? Who is the church? We are. In fact, I would venture to, to say, and I want to encourage you, the church is them. The church is you all. Instead of going, the church is me, it's still a little egocentric, believe it or not. The, the church is you. The church is you. And we've been called to, to love the church. Now, here's the deal. I want you to like Terra Nova. 
But, but I Love My Church isn't this building, it's not Terra Nova, it's not personalities, it's people. And so I, I don't care where your membership is, I don't care where you give your money, if you don't genuinely love the church, the body of Christ, those that Jesus came to die for, you've missed it. And everything you're doing is in vain. So these are four things that you need to practice, that you need to practice. Number one, real love serves. Real love serves. Real love serves others. It's not self-serving, but it's serving. And so, uh, you know, Jesus, he, he came and, and he served. And so real love serves. Number two, real love sustains. Real love sustains. Now, this may apply to some of you, but if you can't apply it to yourself, I know every one of you could think of someone that you've seen this happen to. You've seen people who come to church, they walk an aisle, they raise their hand, they say a prayer, they even join a ministry team, they do it for a while, they're gung-ho, they're blazing hot, and before long they begin to just fade out and fade away. They get their feelings hurt, they, they aren't made a priority, they, they don't get kudos, it gets tiring, Nobody's helping me. Whatever reasons or justifications, but they just begin to fade away. Here's, here's what I'm going to challenge you. It's because what happened, walking an aisle, raising a hand, saying a prayer, that was an external thing. It wasn't an inward transformation. It was not about falling in love with Jesus. Because when you experience the love of the Father and you're in that dance that we've talked about and you're responding day in and day out to the fact that He loves you and you're responding because you love him, listen to me, people are going to hurt you, people are going to disappoint you, people are going to let you down, but it's the love relationship with Jesus that sustains, real love sustains. Even in the body of Christ, listen to me, real love sustains. There are men and women in this church, in this room right now that I have disappointed, that I have failed, that I have upset, that I have unintentionally hurt, but here's why they keep coming back. Because they're practicing real love. Real love sustains. Real love sustains. Ask Tim Bartlett. Real love sustains. Last night he wanted to choke my neck. I've been honorary to him. I deserved it. All right? But here's the reality. I honestly, genuinely could upset Tim. I could hurt Justin. I could make Micah offended. All those things but here's the reality, because we understand love, it sustains. It's, it's, it's where grace and mercy abound, and forgiveness is absolutely priority. You see, we have to practice that. We have to practice engaging in real love relationships with one another. Number three, not only does real love serve and sustain, but real love sacrifices. Real love sacrifices you've heard me say this before but I'll say it again you can give without loving you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving real love when it's practiced it costs something it's something sacrificial you see I could go to McDonald's and I could order my meal and the lady behind the counter asked me if I would like to donate my change to the Ronald McDonald House, and to the little container on the counter. And I can say, yes, for the love of you pestering me, yes. And I can give. And I can give without really loving the family utilizing the Ronald McDonald House. Right? I can give without love, but I cannot love without giving. If you are a parent and you have children, you know this. Because you love your children. And oftentimes, as an expression of your love, you find yourself doing a whole lot of giving. Giving of yourself, your time, your resources. You give because you realize you can't effectively love without giving. You see, as we practice real love, it serves, it sustains, it's sacrificing. And then finally, it shares. Real love shares. You've heard this phrase too. You really don't care how much someone knows until you know they care. You see, here's the reality. 
Real love shares burdens. Real love shares life. Real love carries the load. Real love is, is sharing. And so I would encourage you this morning to evaluate your week. Have you been practicing? Have, and, and again, why do we practice? Let's just take a break for a second. Why do we practice? To make yourself better. I, I mean, here's the reality. The Cardinals have started. And, and I hope their practice in spring training pays off. Because they practice in order that they might win, right? They practice so that they might be perfected in their game. Why is it that we should practice love? Because here's the truth and the reality. There's no one within the sound of my voice that you've arrived yet. There's no one in this room who's mastered it. It's important that we continually practice loving like Jesus. Because ultimately, we get better and better at it. And so my, my challenge is, evaluate your week. Have I been practicing? Have I been serving? Have I been sacrificing? Have I been sharing? Have I been sustaining in my love? And then finally, this morning, I want to close with this. Not only is love something that should be a priority and be practiced, but here is something that you cannot change. Love is permanent. The permanence of love. Faith and hope will will leave the, the gifts of the spirit will cease but love remains it is always here it is the thing that is eternal it is eternal the greatest is love everything else passes away and so love should be a priority it should be something you walk in and practice can i tell you what's going to make us the greatest church in this region it's not the preaching though i think it's pretty good it's not the worship, though I think we've probably got the best. You know what's going to make us a church that people will, will be where you're at and go, golly, you know what? I go to church with a bunch of messed up, jacked up people. But doggone it, I kind of just love them. Here's what's going to make us the most desirable church in the region. Is that you just really love each other. Not only that you love each other, but you really love out there. Like you really, genuinely, authentically love. Can, can I tell you something? And, and every one of you, you know this to be true. Because it's what, it's what captivated you. It's what's drawn you in. Is there is something irresistible about being loved. In fact, I would venture to say the places you go, and you spend your money, you spend your time, what you do, I would venture to say it's because there's some affection that you feel. Why is it you visit the same restaurant over and over and over? Because you got a favorite waitress or waiter, or you like the owner, they're nice, they make you feel loved and important. I love going to Pizza Inn because I can walk in and they go, you drinking Diet Coke or is this a root beer day? And it's all depending on how my day's going. And she knows that I either do Diet Coke or root beer. I love it. I feel like I have a little bit of affection there. The food is good. I'm drawn because I feel love. You do the same thing. It's irresistible. I mean, even on the bad days when there's no pizza on the buffet and what is there is cold, I'll still go back. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There's something about being loved that's irresistible. Why is it that that friend, man, they could talk to you like, like you're not even their friend? Jennifer teases me all this time. She says, I don't know how you have all these guys of friends. You, like, run them off and stuff, but they just keep coming back. It's because I could be funny and, and honorary, but they know that I love them. We're, we're, we're attracted to being loved. See, John loves me. I know that. And so It's fun. That's what's going to do it. And so if you've got your Bible, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16. Turn a few pages back. I want to end with this verse. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Verse 14 says this. Let all that you do be done in love. I'm going to invite Jake and the team back up this morning. And as we close, I want you to think about this. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul is giving instruction to, to stand firm, to be strong, to be courageous, to be bold, to, to, to stand on our guard. He, he's saying all these things, but then he says, let everything you do be done in love, because particularly for us as guys, we like to be bold and stand firm and be courageous. And if we're not careful, that gives us a big head. It gives us a certain um, security in ourselves, and we're sometimes arrogant and boastful in that, but... Paul comes right along behind that and says, but let everything you do be done in love. So when you stand firm, when you're bold, when you're courageous, 
let everything you do be done in love. Can I give you the Greek definition of everything? When it says, let everything you do be done in love, here's what the Greek means. Everything. I studied real hard for that. Let everything be done in love. That means when you go to Burger King, and you go to Burger King to have it your way, like we all do, and when you go to Burger King and you order your burger or your chicken sandwich your way, and they give it to you, and it's not your way, let everything you do be done in love. This past week, I got a chicken sandwich, and doggone it, I had lettuce and mayo on it. I did not order lettuce and mayo, but I considered let everything I do be done in love. And so instead of slapping the chicken sandwich back on the counter and going, that's not the way I ordered it, I grabbed a fry and I scraped and scraped and shook it off and I ate it. Let everything you do be done in love. Even the way we respond at Walmart when, when there's a huge store with like 18 checkouts but only two are open. Let everything we do be done in love. I'm starting to, to identify with some of you, aren't I? When your child lies to you and says, no, I didn't have homework, but the next morning before they get on the bus or get out the door, they've got their pen and their paper and they're rushing around and you are absolutely infuriated. Let everything you do be done in love. I mean, not that that's happened at my house, just so you know. But let everything we do be done in love. I don't think we understand that. I don't think we really are getting that. But let everything we do be done in love. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you that you are love. It's not that you just love, but you are the embodiment of love. And God, through our love relationship with you, God, you've called us to make love a priority. God, many of us, we have things we're chasing and running after and accomplishing. But God, apart from love, it's nothing. God, for many of us, we're having conversations we're even coming, with, coming up with, with cute little phrases that ultimately are offensive on Facebook and we think we're trying to make a difference, but it's done apart from love. God, God we, we sound like a clanging cymbal or a gong. When we act and we respond apart from love, God, we're ultimately ineffective. And so God, let us, the bride of Christ, let us capture that. That everything we do must be done in love invite you to stand your feet all across.